And the Bible study is titled, the series is titled, Walking with Our God, A Journey in Psalms. Now, I want you to notice we're not calling this a journey through Psalms because we are not going to go all the way through the Psalms. We're not going to make it through all 150 Psalms in about the next 10 weeks. That's just not, that's simply not going to happen. It's just not possible. And, and. I also want to point out that we're not, I'm not saying this is a journey through the Psalms because we should never be on the other side of the Psalms. The Psalms, we are in the midst of life and the Psalms are for living in the midst of life. So many times even uh, we refer to Psalm 23, the most beloved of all the Psalms, We probably all could recite it with our eyes closed and standing on our head facing backward. You know, we all know Psalm 23 that well. But we most often associate Psalm 23 with times of death and times of mourning and grieving. And rightly so, because it references walking through the valley of the shadow of death. However, Psalm 23 is much more about life than it is about death. So much more about life than about death. So all of the Psalms are for life. All of the Psalms are prayers for our daily living. And so this study that we're doing, uh, walking with our God, a journey in the Psalms is just that. How do these Psalms fit into our daily prayer life and into our daily worshiping life? Now, our girls, Anlin and Eva, are really learning... uh, uh, it's wonderful to watch, but they are learning to find their way around their Bibles. And any time we're together and, and reading the Bible, doing a family devotion, or calling for a special scripture, uh, the, the girls are learning how to find their way through the scriptures, which is really a wonderful thing. They're learning what's Old Testament. They're learning what's New Testament. Uh, But what I hear from them time and time again, and this is something they've picked up in the last three years, being here in Sunday school and missions at Viewmont, is they are learning the importance of the Psalms as it relates to the Scriptures and where the Psalms lie in the Scriptures. They will say, okay, if I'm looking for a particular book in the Bible, I open my Bible in the middle and there's the Psalms. Now stop and think about it. Think about that. That's pretty much right, is it not? The Psalms is just about, the Psalter is pretty much dead center in your Bible. If you were to take your Bible and open it up to the very middle, you probably would fall somewhere within the Psalms. This truly remarkable collection of writings that are both profound and simple at the same time. They speak about God and they speak for us at the same time. These are words that are both human and holy. Now, last time we were together, two weeks ago, when we began this incredible journey in the Psalms, I want to remind you of one of the things that I shared with you, and that is the words of the fourth century church father, Athanasius. Athanasius said that, Everywhere else in the scriptures, we find that the words speak to us. They speak to us. They tell us about God. They tell us about God's activity. But it is the Psalms, Athanasius says, that speak for us. And that's a unique distinction. The Psalms speak for us. When we go to other places in the scriptures, be they the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, the historical books of King Samuel Chronicles, uh, whether we go to the prophets or whether we go to the gospels, Acts, Paul, whatever, those are writings that seem to speak to us. And they tell us about God's relationship with humanity, how God has interacted and how God is interacting with humanity. They tell us about the work of God. But it's here in the Psalms that we come across the cries of the human heart. We come across the prayers of the faithful. 
a longing and a yearning for God's presence. This desperate cry and plea for God to cleanse and forgive and restore the sinner unto righteousness. There's a declaration of faith in God here in the Psalms that God is our refuge, our fortress, and ever-present help in times of trouble. There's a lot to say about the Psalms that fall here in the very middle of our Bible. And over these next several weeks, we're going to take some time to walk in these Psalms and to get a feel for the Psalms. And I remind you, and if you've not already picked up a handout for tonight's Bible study, they are over here on the podium with copies of tonight's prayer sheet. But I want to remind you, I want to remind you of the four big questions that I laid out before you two weeks ago when we began this study. These are the four big questions that we are going to be asking ourselves over and over and over again. Each and every week, these questions will come back up. How do the Psalms speak for us? How does that work? How do they speak on our behalf? How do the Psalms reveal God? What do we see about God? Well, how do the Psalms describe God? What do we learn about the character, the heart, and the person of God? What about ourselves? If these are prayers for us, if these are prayers that are cries of the human heart, then what do the Psalms reveal about us as human beings? What do the Psalms reveal about who we are? And how do the Psalms deepen our relationship with God? How do the Psalms function in our daily lives? There's a lot to that. There's an awful lot to those four questions. Because you see, these are not merely words, human words that are addressed to God. These are holy words that are also spoken to us. This is holy inspired scripture. And we must remember that it is holy inspired scripture. But the Psalms are unique among the books of the canon because they are the cries of the human heart and they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, they have, there is this ability for the Psalms to speak for us and the Psalms to speak to us. Now tonight, what we're going to do is take, a, take some time to do a general overview and introduction of the Psalms. What are the Psalms? Uh, how did the Psalms come to be? What's some of the history related to, how, to the Psalter itself? What about issues of dating and, and how do we know when and where and how and by whom? Uh, all these kinds of things. We're going to ask about theological emphases that are included in the Psalms. We're going to look at some literary features of the Psalms. And then finally, we're going to make a Christological connection at the end to connect all of this to Jesus. Now, you may be wondering right now, how in the world is Pastor Andrew going to fit all of that in in the next, oh, I don't know, 40 minutes or so? I'm going to do my best, okay? So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens with this. But that's where I intend to go with tonight's study. Each writing in the Bible, each individual writing, each book, each sacred text had a beginning. There was a time when pen was put to parchment and it was written down. There was a time when, when the scriptures were coming to be and each is written out of a need. Out of a need, there is a need to chronicle the activity and the relationship between God and humanity. What is God doing? How is God moving? How is God revealing himself to his people? Who are his people? What is God's activity like? And so there came this time where this needed to be chronicled and needed to be written down. And from the opening lines of Scripture, from the very beginning of of the Bible and the canon itself, we see that there is this story being told that is God and creation and how God and creation are in relationship together. And in Genesis chapter one, 
verse 1, we all should know Genesis 1-1, right? And, right? We should, anyway. In the beginning, what? God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God. It all begins with God. It all ends with God at the end. And everything in between is about God's interaction with humanity and with creation. All the way, all the way from, as my dad used to say, from Genesis all the way to maps at the end. You know, the maps that are included there at the end of your Bible. All, from Genesis all the way to maps, we have this description of God's activity in relationship. God creates, God pronounces that it is good. And it's when Adam and Eve then choose to live outside of the bounds of how God has set the relationship up that God then goes looking for them. One of my favorite passages in the scripture, favorite verses is Genesis 3, 8. This is after Adam and Eve have chosen to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they see that they are naked and they run and hide. And what does God do? He takes off after them. He's taking his habitual walk through the garden in the cool of the day and is calling out to Adam and Eve, where are you? Where are you? I know what you've done. I have to make this right. I have to set this back where it belongs. We see that God is going looking for his wayward children, longing to restore the relationship that is broken. And from there all the way to the end of the revelation where we see the new heavens and the new earth on the last day, this relationship between God and creation is at the forefront. In particular, God and humanity. It moves through the calling of one man, Abram. One man out of many nations. Abram is called. And out of Abram will come one nation, Israel. And out of one nation will come one man, Jesus, the Word made flesh, who was there to bring about rescue, redemption, and resurrection, and make salvation available to all of creation. That Jesus is the rescue plan of God. And that it's only by the cross that this is accomplished. Only by the cross. But I love the way the opening scenes of creation give us a glimpse of the creator and how God is intimately woven into creation. He speaks over creation. He blesses it and calls it good, sings over it with an everlasting love. And then we see that words are foundational to this relationship between God and creation. For how does God create? He speaks and it happens. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, right? And God said, let the dry land give forth fruits and vegetables, and let the birds of the air, and let the fish of the sea, and let us make man in our image. God speaks, and it happens. The word is important. And then when God goes looking for Adam and Eve, what does God do? He calls out to them, does he not? He calls, uses words and says, where are you? Where are you? I want to restore this relationship together. What have you done? Who told you you were naked? What's happened? Tell me. You see, words are critical in this relationship, are they not? We must be able to share words with one another. God speaks and the people speak. And so the Psalms, the Psalms came to be out of this need to be able to communicate with God. The Psalms were birthed and have their origin in this longing and desire to be able to speak to God and to speak about all the issues of life, the variety of of issues. As you read through the Psalms, you will see that there is joy and there is sorrow in the Psalms. 
You will see that there is birth and there is death. You will see that there is provision and there is lack. You will see that there are friends and there are enemies. There is tragedy. There is triumph all included in the Psalms. You see, the Psalms speak about and speak to all of the ups and downs in life. And so the Psalms kind of came to be, they were birthed out of this need to be able to express all of this, to be able to go to God in prayer and to share the ups and downs and the ins and the outs of this relationship with God. Think about Psalm 51 for a moment. Psalm 51, out of one of the most dark times in King David's life, after he has been confronted by Nathan the prophet about his adulterous sin with Bathsheba, and David knows my relationship with God, it ain't right. And I've got to do something about it. And I know God is there. And I know God will hear me. Create in me a clean heart. Oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cleanse me with hyssop. Cleanse me, oh God. You see, that's a cry. And it's a cry about the relationship David has with God, right? And about that relationship being restored. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Remind me that I'm still yours. Remind me that even in my brokenness, you bring healing and you bring wholeness. The Psalms of Thanksgiving are there when we are in times of incredible joy. I give thanks to the Lord with all my heart, Psalm 138 says. I thank the Lord with all my heart. Seasons of suffering when we're going through the valley of the shadow of death, those psalms of lament, like Psalm 13, Psalm 88, those are incredibly helpful psalms for us to pray. Confession of sin and pleading for forgiveness, those penitent psalms are so important. And what does it look like? How is it described to walk with God all the way to the temple in Jerusalem and to be like the travelers from afar who are coming from the far and distant diasporic lands and they're moving their way to Jerusalem and they're coming to worship the Lord? What is that like? Read the Psalms of Ascents that are included in the Scripture from Psalm 120 on to about 134. You see, the Psalms come out of this need, this desire, this, ex- this longing to express as best we can in spoken terms this relationship with God and the intricacies of our lives. The Psalms are birthed out of a deep in our soul need to commune with God. That's where the Psalms come from. And there's something to be said for that kind of intimate relationship. If you spend any time in the Psalms at all, you will find that the psalmist seems to hold nothing back. Right? The psalmist holds nothing back. When things aren't good, the psalmist says, I know I can go before the Lord with this. When things are excellent, the psalmist says, there's only one place I can go to give thanks. And everything in between, my whole life is built around the presence of God and the move of God. And everything I do and say is based upon that. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is truly an incredible relationship and this ability to express with God how we're feeling and what we're going through, we can find the same to be true in our own lives that the psalmist found in theirs. You see, the psalms were and still are this way of communicating with God in such a way that we are drawn into the presence of God. 
They are uniquely powerful among the writings of Scripture because they come out of this lived life of faith, this journey and walk with God, this real life experience with God. And I believe that the Psalms are important for us as individuals and for us as a body, as a congregation, because these two express our journey and our walk with the Lord. Now you see how the Psalms kind of originated, where they kind of came from, this need to describe and reflect upon and express the relationship with God. But the question of authorship and who wrote the Psalms is a much more complicated question. Where did the Psalms come from? Who is responsible for the Psalms? They were composed not over a weekend, not overnight, but over many, many, many years. Many years. All 150 Psalms as we know them in the collection we have them is probably a post-exilic collection of writings after the exile, after, uh, after the Hebrews, the Israelites have returned from exile in Babylon. And therefore, since it probably stretches over centuries, there is not one singular author who is responsible for the Psalms. Now, many of the Psalms will have a superscription put up there at the top. You'll see uh, Psalm such and such of David or Psalm such and such of Asaph. A lot of times these superscriptions do not indicate authorship necessarily as they indicate usage or dedication or how they're used in the life of the people. By and large, many of the Psalms are attributed to King David. Now we know the story of David, at, at least I, I hope we know the story of David as told in Samuel and Chronicles. The story of David is that he is the youngest of the sons of Jesse, right? He's probably a short fellow, uh, probably a, maybe the runt of the litter, right? As we would be tempted to say. Uh, David was a skilled musician. David was a shepherd. David becomes the second king of the United Kingdom of Israel, does he not? When Samuel, the prophet, makes his way to Bethlehem and to the house of Jesse, David becomes a valiant warrior, does he not? Saul has slain his thousands, but what? David, his tens of thousands. David becomes this incredible warrior king. He stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with the nine-foot-tall Goliath of the Philistines. David's also a broken and contrite sinner. For not only does he commit adultery with Bathsheba, but then he murders her husband Uriah to cover it up, right? And we think of David as both saint and sinner, but Luke... In Acts chapter 13, Luke refers to David as a man after God's own heart. How is that the case? Well, that is in ups and downs, twists and turns, light and dark in life. David still knew, even when he had done wrong, David knew my heart really belongs to God. And I can only come back to God. That's where I long to be. My heart longs for you, O oh God. There are some psalms included here in the Psalter that can be pointed to a particular moment in the life of David, such as Psalm 3. Very early in the Psalter, there's a superscription that provides not only is this a psalm of David, but also the context of the psalm itself. It's described when David, when he was fleeing from his son Absalom, and he's He's in danger and he's longing to kind of find refuge and solace. And Psalm 3 comes out of that period in David's life. One of the scholarly issues that surrounds these superscriptions, though, that we find with the Psalms has to do with the Hebrew language itself. And some of the Psalms that are listed of blank, of David or of Asaph, Really, in Hebrew, that could be translated dedicated to. Dedicated to David or dedicated to Asaph. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann 
makes the suggestion that we have the same case in our day when we refer to the King James Bible. Now, we all know that King James I did not write the King James Bible, right? We all know that. And we all know that uh, for the sake of simplicity and shortening the story, uh, King James I is the one who said, let's have a Bible in our language. Let's have one we can read. And so commissioned and had it done. And so when we say the King James Bible, it's just kind of this dedication. Okay. Yeah. King James, he's the one who blah, blah, blah. Now, since we do have a church historian in our midst, Dr. Chris Moore, uh, he may, he may have a few other things to say about, about the story of the King James Bible, which is an interesting story by the way. But for the sake of making the point, the Psalms, we can also say sort of the same thing about the Psalms. Psalm 3 and Psalms 51 and 52 are pretty clear that they come from the life of David. Psalm 3, fleeing from Absalom. Psalms 51 and 52, after the affair with Bathsheba. But Psalm 122, Psalm 122 says of David, but there is little, if anything, in Psalm 122 that indicates that it came from David. There's no historical cues within the text that would point to it. The psalm may have been dedicated to David. Now, what's so significant about this, about Psalm 122, it begins with these words, uh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is one of the psalms of ascents. This is where the people would have been traveling from far off and making their way to the second temple in Jerusalem from these lands where they've been scattered after the exile and they are coming back to the house of God in Jerusalem. Now, which king was responsible for setting up Jerusalem as the capital city and seeing to it that the temple would be built there? Which king was that? David, right? David is the one who brought the ark to Jerusalem. David is the one who said, this will be the city. This will be the capital. This will be where we are. So this Psalm 122 that has to do with coming back to the temple, it's going to be dedicated to David because he was the great king who was seeing to it that the temple would be there, even though it was Solomon who carried out the plans. Out of all 150 psalms included in the Psalter, there are some 34 that lack a superscription. Some 34 psalms do not have any kind of reference to them. And Old Testament scholars will uh, kind of refer to these as orphan psalms. An orphan psalm. We don't know necessarily where they came from or how they originated, but we can have a guess here or there but there's no superscription attached to them. Now, when you think about these issues of authorship, some are rooted in the historical life of David, but some, like Psalm 122 and other Psalms of Ascent, are certainly post-exilic. We know that they come from a period of years, a long period of time. When you look at when things happened in the life of David, say with Absalom and his fleeing from Absalom somewhere early 11th century BC when David was king. You compare that with Psalm 126. I'll flip to Psalm 126 real quick. Let's, let's read a little bit of the Psalm. This is Bible study. We probably should read some of the Bible, should we not? So Psalm 126, a song of sense. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion... Well, that's pretty clear. When the Lord brought us back to Zion, that references the exile. We were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations. Again, that could be an exilic, post-exilic reference because all the nations were thinking, well, what's happened to Israel? They've fallen apart. And now they're coming back. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes. Bring back, O oh God, the fortunes we had like the streams in the Negev. 
Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Here, Psalm 126, it's pretty clear that's a post-exilic psalm, probably coming from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah in the rebuilding of that kind of post-exilic period. Therefore, this would have, could have easily been some five centuries or so between the writing of Psalm 3 and the writing of Psalm 126. Now, Old Testament scholar James Mays offers a great way for us to think about this. He says that while many of the Psalms are difficult to nail down in terms of dating them as to when they were written, and they may have very little information about who wrote them, they nonetheless come out of the history of the people of Israel. In fact, Mays writes, in kind, the Psalms are not history, nor are they directly about history, but they have a history. This is important to remember, church, because these are words within history. They are words about human history. They are words within human history about God and about this relationship. And think about it. Every time you pray, your prayers have a history to them, don't they? Every single one of them. Your prayers have a history and a need and a context for them. And it comes out of a variety, a whole span of life. And what we know as the collection of the Psalms, we call it the Psalter, I mentioned this earlier, is dated at this collection as we have it is post-exilic Israelite life. That much we can deduce. The Psalms span the time frame from this very early corporate Israelite worship all the way to the post-exilic period. But one thing remains the same. One thing remains the same through the centuries of worship under the Lord from the people of Israel. The Psalms are theologically sound and they are rooted in reality, in the presence, in the power, and the person of God. Now, with anybody of Scripture... The Psalms have a theology, and they are theologically rich and meaningful. As we saw last time, they paint a picture of God who is both high and exalted, way up here, the king of all creation, and the shepherd who is walking with his sheep. So God is both of those, high and lifted up, and very much feet on the ground with his people. Numerous times, The Lord is referred to by his covenantal name, Yahweh. You can always tell, and I've shared this with you before, you can always tell when the divine covenantal name is used in the scriptures because it will be in all caps. It'll be a big L and then O-R-D. It'll be smaller, but it'll still be capital letters. That indicates the divine name within the Hebrew text. The divine name, the name of the covenant, the name that's revealed to Moses when Moses is at the burning bush and says, all right, who am I supposed to tell Pharaoh has sent me to him? Well, you tell him I am has sent me to you. The name I am has no past, no present, no future, meaning the Lord is always in a state of is, eternally present, with an eye in the past and the future, there is no place within time where God is not. For God is above time. And this name revealed to Moses at the burning bush and then the covenant made at Sinai after the people come out of Egypt and are there in the desert is important. It's this name of relationship. And when the divine name, Yahweh, is used in the Psalms, you can pretty much count on the fact that the verb chesed is not far behind it. I love this verb chesed because it means the covenantal faithful love of God. It's the love of God that is faithful even when we are unfaithful. 
that God is always faithful and true. Sometimes it's translated loving kindness. The loving kindness of God, that's hesed. There are other psalms known as the Eloistic psalms that don't refer to God as Yahweh, but they come from this Eloist tradition in the Old Testament. This theology from God is Elohim, which means powerful one. It's a reflection of the story of creation in Genesis 1 where God has the ability to do anything he wishes. There is nothing God cannot do. Do you agree with that? There's nothing God cannot do, right? The arm of the Lord is never too short to save. God can do anything. A great example of an Eloistic psalm is Psalm 77. Here we have this depiction of God, not as Yahweh, but as God who has great power. In particular, the power to bring salvation. And when you read through Psalm 77, you find the psalmist, it's dedicated to Asaph, is one, who's one of the choir and music leaders under the Davidic reign and rule when David is king. But we see how various parts of nature and creation respond to God as all-powerful. Look at Psalm 77, verses 16 through 19. Psalm 77, 16 through 19. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen. There we have this description of how the waters respond to the power of God. And in particular, kind of driving back the sea for the people to cross upon dry land. There we see God's power at work. God is covenantally faithful. God is all powerful. We can't forget both of those. One of the major theological emphases throughout the the deep relationship that we have with God is that it is a beautiful and strong relationship. Psalm 1 describes this relationship. Flip, flip back to Psalm 1. Here's how the Psalms begin. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Here we have a description about those who walk with the Lord and those who do not walk with with the Lord and this intimate description of the relationship and it's a life of faith. And at the center of this life of faith is our praise unto God. And we're going to spend some time next week looking at the the Psalms of praise, but the depth of our relationship with God is always directly connected to the depth of our worshiping life. Always. The depth of our relationship with God is always in direct correlation and connection to, our, to the depth of our worship of God. The deeper our worship goes, the deeper our relationship with God goes. The deeper it goes. The Psalms, time and again, make reference to the temple, long, the house of God going into the holy sanctuary, the holy house in Jerusalem, the dwelling place of God, where New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says that the heaven and earth overlap and interlock with one another. It's this kind of crossroads on earth, the temple itself, much more than just brick and mortar. This is the dwelling place of God. 
And this has to do with the Davidic connections, the connections with David themselves. But more than that, this is a theological emphasis. For the temple itself is not necessarily about the structure. It is about the presence that dwells therein. It's about the presence of God. Always the presence of God. And drawing into the presence of God. And that's worship, my friends. That is worship. Coming into the presence of God. At the very heart of the Psalms is this invitation to worship. Time and again, we hear the Psalms begin with a a call, an invitation. Come, let us worship the Lord. Come, let us sing to the Lord. The temple was the center of worship, the place where the people were invited to come and meet with God. And time and time again, we are called into that time of worship. And let me just say that worship is not reserved for 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Worship is not just about that one hour. Worship is the life we lead all the time. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing unto you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, more than just on Sunday morning. Right? Worship is a way of life. It's not just something we do. But at the very heart of the Psalms is this invitation to come and worship. Now, you may have noticed as you flip through the Psalms before, you may have noticed these headings, book one, book two, book three, book four. Book, have you ever noticed that? When the Psalms kind of have that division, really don't know uh, how or why or kind of there's some suggested kind of structure maybe as to kind of organization within the, the five books of the Psalms. But I think it has much more to do with the fact that there are five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the five books of Moses, that's the law, right? That's the details of the covenant and how the and and this relationship that Israel has with God. And so the five books of the Psalms kind of pick up on that and correspond as a way of saying, here's how the worshiping life of the covenant is then to flow. This is, this is what it looks like to live this out in a life of faith, to be fleshed out. And each of the five books, each and every one of them, the last line has to do with praise unto the Lord. It all comes back to worship. Let's look at them. Psalm 41, verse 13 the last verse in book one. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, amen and amen. That's how book one ends. How does book two end? Psalm 72, verse 19. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. What about book three? Psalm 89, 52. Psalm 89, 52. Verse 52, where are you? There you are. Praise be to the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Then book four, Psalm 106, verse 48. Psalm 106, 48. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. That's how book four ends. What about book five? Go to the very end, Psalm 150, verse 6. There we have these words. Let everything that has breath, what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You see, At the end of each one of these collections, there is this call to praise, the call to worship. That means at the center of our life of faith 
is a life of worship, a life of praise. Now, in each one of the books of the Psalms, you will find all kinds of life experience. Ups, downs, twists, turns, light, dark, good, bad, ugly, everything in between. But each book of the Psalms ends with the same thing. Praise be to God. God is the only one worthy of praise. For God is the only one who has brought us through all these seasons of life. There's a lot of beautiful literary features included in the Psalms as well. One of my favorites is called a chiasm. And you'll see a chiasm at work. In Psalm one, let's look at one. Psalm 121 is a good example of a chiasm. It, is, it too is one of the Psalms of ascents. A chiasm works like this. The first line and the last line correspond with one another. And then the second line and the next to the last line, they correspond with one another. And then the third line and the next one up from the bottom, they correspond until you work your way to the very middle and then you kind of see the main push and thrust of the psalm. It's this kind of beautiful, starts here, comes up and comes back down and it's like a stair step, up and back down. Psalm 121 is a, has a chiastic structure to it. I lift up mine eyes unto the hills from where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. And you can take these lines and kind of see how they correspond beginning and end, and work your way to the very middle. Verse 4 is the central piece. It's kind of the crux of all of this. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And that encompasses the whole of life. And we see it's a journey from beginning to end. The Psalms have a lot of beautiful literary features like chiasms involved there. The phrase we keep coming back to, and I'm going to try to go ahead and just wrap this up because you didn't think I could do it, did you? The phrase we're going to keep coming back to week after week is this phrase from Athanasius, the fourth century church father, about the Psalms speaking for us. They become our words. I think Athanasius is right in that, but I also want to take it a step further. Following Athanasius and some of incorporating some of his Christology, I shared with you in our last session about Athanasius that one of the main contributions he made to the church was our understanding and our theology of Jesus as the Son of God, our Christology. Who is Jesus? Athanasius said essentially that Jesus, the Christ, the Son, is of the same substance as God. Jesus is not God Jr. Jesus is not a created being Jesus is equal with God. And Athanasius said that a created being cannot save other created beings. Only God can do that. And so Athanasius' Christology, his words about Christ, and his soteriology, his words about salvation, go hand in hand. They have to go hand in hand. What we say about Jesus, what we say about salvation, have to work together. And this is just what we believe. We're going to close tonight with John, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. You may know John 1, 14. After John has unpacked or moving through his prologue, describing the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 Then the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here we see this coming together, divinity, humanity, coming together in one. The word became flesh. Old Testament scholar 
J. Clinton McCann says that not only do the Psalms speak for us, but they are also inspired scripture. They come from the Holy Spirit. And we consider them to be as much scripture as the Gospels. Therefore, they have the same authority and inspiration as any other writing. They speak to our lives. This places the Psalms in a unique category for they speak on our behalf and they speak to us. The same way Jesus understands on our behalf. He is our mediator. He is our intercessor. He is our great high priest. He is God made flesh, right? Don't we believe that? Jesus goes to the Father on our behalf, our intercessor. At the same time, Jesus speaks to us as Lord of all creation. And Jesus directs us. Go and teach them, teach all the nations to observe everything I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the very ends of the earth. Jesus is our high priest who goes to God on our behalf. Jesus is our good shepherd who speaks to us and calls us by name. He is the king of kings. He is the firstborn from among the dead. That is our Jesus. He speaks for us. He also speaks to us. Don't we believe that? We should. It's core of who we are. Our relationship with God is clearly defined through Christ. We are made right with God through Christ. Christ is God with us. Christ speaks for us. The Psalms, they speak for us. They speak to us. They show us Christ. We see Christ embodied in the Psalms. When Jesus hangs on the cross, his cry of dereliction, the deepest part of his suffering He cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know where that comes from? Psalm 22. Psalm 20. Jesus not only is calling out the psalm, Jesus is embodying the psalm, enfleshing the psalm. So now, with a brief introduction to the Psalms under our belts, we can begin our study. We will begin looking next week at Psalms of praise. And what do the Psalms of praise reveal about God, reveal about us? How are we to respond to God through praise? And how do the Psalms fit into all of that? Will you go to the Lord in prayer with me? O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. You are high and lifted up. You are with us. You love us. You hold us accountable. You forgive and cleanse us. You set us on the right path. You guard over us and provide for us. You protect us and you pull us out of the slimy pit. Thank you, O God, for the gift of the Psalms that they speak for us and to us. May we follow you. May our lives, the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And now, as Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Go in peace.